Okay, thanks for having me. Tonight I'm going to give you a little bit of a rundown on a few of my ideas and so forth. Uh, first thing I've seen on my picture here, that's the front of my big apron is, hey, I need to get the paintbrush out. And secondly, it shows a waiver, that's, I assure you, my, my apron doesn't bend. It's dead straight. Okay. I run pretty big Avery's, but just because I've been, been, I run big Avery's doesn't necessarily mean that's the, the way to go. There's a lot of birds breeding small Avery's, but the principles are still, still the same of how to keep your birds. Uh, fundamentals. What do you need? You need protection. Weather, predators, inside and out. And I mean inside, because you can have birds in that avian that can do more damage to your other uh, quieter birds than any hawk will do. You know, I've heard of Madagascar weavers. A mate of mine was looking after a pair. We put them in an avian and 23 red-headed buildings went to the promised land. So the point I'm saying is before you stock your birds, buy your birds, do a bit of research on them to make sure that the bird you're about to put in is compatible with those inmates. Okay. You need nesting sites and display areas. There's not birds apart from nesting will some will use variation of cleaned areas of the aviary floor or foliage to display to the females. Whether it be, also you see them on a perch with a bit of straw bouncing <coughs> away. Other birds need uh, areas of far more cover, so you've got to think about that as well. Pictorellas displaying on the ground around clumps of grass. They don't see, I have never seen them display on a perch. Okay, space. That comes back to don't overcrowd. It's nice to have heaps of birds in the aviary, but Less is best, particularly with birds. The less pairs of birds you have in your aviary, the more chance you've got to breed them and the more youngsters you'll breed. Diet. Well, there's so many things that on the market these days. We've got the variation is amazing. But you still need the basics. You still need to see your water, your live food maybe, and so forth. Get your balance. Of your, get your initial program organised, then you can look at supplements and so forth that will enhance the chances of you breeding birds or probably bring them in a better condition or better colour. So, get into that. Then you come to this last one observation and observation. Mm. I could have put it in three, four, or five times. The more you watch your birds, the better you will have better results. Now we have proved this, I'll show it a bit later on, and we've got a facility now that enables me to watch the birds. I've been keeping birds too long, and I probably have learned more in the last three years from at least having a facility to watch my birds than I did in the other, all the other years. I can tell from my big aviary, from my room, what birds are nesting, where they're nesting, and when they started, now this, you're talking on an aviary 100 feet long by 60 feet wide. I can tell by the patterns. You, feed, you have feeding stations which enable you to watch. You have other areas where water where they come in to drink. You have other areas where you have nesting material. And these are the guides. I can see a weaver, for instance, picking up two inch or 50 mil pieces of nesting and I watch her which way she goes. And I can work out where they're nesting. I also know what birds are compatible. You'd be surprised how many, what birds you think are quiet, which are really aggressive. I watch cordon blues. They can start fighting all the way up to the, the top of the roof and right to the ground. But I get away with it because I've got space. Yet bring those birds into a smaller area, they have to put, they, they'll fight, but they can't get away from each other. So. You, you've got to have that in mind. Uh, okay. Nesting, sites, shelter and protection. Okay. 
This one here in the aviary, you can see it's not overgrown. Personally, I can't understand why people have heavily, uh, aviaries heavily planted where the birds can hardly move around because the majority of our birds, the seed eaters, are grass finches which come from the open. African species where it's open with a few thorn bushes. They don't want a, a jungle. Possibly your blue-faced parrotfinch may be the exception of the odds and sods, but the majority of the birds we keep don't need heavily planted aviaries. They need space, space to fossic and so forth. So as you can see, all, I've got planted aviaries, but I also have a clear space for the birds. Okay, plants. My plants, every plant in this aviary has a purpose. It's not there for, for looks, but that helps. For instance, roses, birds like thorn bushes. Thorn bushes and birds' rings don't match. You'll get them hooked up and everything. But rose bushes you get away with, all your thorns point downwards, so if a bird does get hooked up, it'll fall off. So we get away with it. Hence, I use roses there. Also, I must admit, they don't look too bad, but they are very, very popular nest sites. Can I have someone sit here and change them for me? That would make it a lot easier for you. I'm sorry about this. Right. Yeah, just, I'll just say change. Press the red button. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, planted. You've got there, you've got a few names, but a very few prickly um, conifers, roses and grasses. Just go through and roll them all. Okay, this is not the same aviary, but this is a smaller aviary. <coughs> you've got your thicker area, you've got a bush for them to go in, your rose bush coming through. The roses, standard roses are excellent because they don't have a root system where anything can burrow in. Put a circle around it with a, and it's even harder for vermin. I've got very old aviaries and I have a mouse problem, but I have to, so I have to have steps to control them. I'll never get rid of them, but I have to control them, I think. Now, that's the thick area. The reason for this there is that's what I call a refuge. When birds fledge youngsters, they want to take them somewhere and hide them. So I have an area like that where they park their young birds, young moonies, weavers and so forth, in particular. Also, if a predator from outside comes along, they've got a nice thick area to barrel straight into. I'd rather them go to there than a shelter or a wall or something like that and hit it, because they'll hit, get into that and hide. Thank you. Right now. Okay, that there is just a stand of Johnson grass. It's, um, I keep together, chopped back to the ground every year. Once again, it gives it cover, but it's one of the few seeding grasses I have in my bird aviary. Going through the grasses you see there, the reason for them is that the weavers will use the, the, the stems, they strip it back, it's, it's fibrous, it won't disintegrate. Also, moonias, uh, starfinches, jacarinis, all of those things utilise it. Once again, you've got open space, into the clumps. The, you can see there a gum tree, that gum tree will be let to grow until it hits the roof, then I ring bark and it becomes a perch. Very successful uh, uh, perch there. Smaller ivory, once again you can see where the, you've got a thick area. I'm not worried about the, the bamboo going through the roof because it won't break the wire, but also if noisy miners or uh, hawks or something come through, it breaks their swoop. So they don't sweep over the cross, they've got to go around it, at least it breaks their flight. So what you've got is a clump of cover, in behind is your shelter. This aver is another aver. Now, you can see there's very little growth there. There's grass, there is a couple of privets down there. We've got an island section. 
that aviary bred a hundred and something birds this year. Yet it's not overgrown, and it's it is adequate for what we what your birds need. Once again, there are spaces open, but it's an area so they can they can utilise the area. Just continue on the same aviary. This grass here is one of the main grasses my birds use. It's surprising what strips it. The millions will pick whole uh, fronds off and take it. All the weavers will strip it and then they, they build their nests out of it. And that, it has a small head which they will get, uh, which they get some seeds off, but it's predominantly a source of nesting material and nesting cycle. There's the heads. Okay. Now, as you can see, this is a grenadier weaver's nest, utilising a rose bush, through uprights, builds it out. It's where you see all the thorns, they're downwards. So I haven't got any problems with anything getting caught up in there, and they're happy with it. Next. Slightly different, there's an orange bishop nest that's in a golden privet. Once again, they're using the verticals and uh, using the growth. In the aviary, we, I have these stations. All they are is a, a piece of tin with a, uh, an old real estate sign underneath them, tucked up, and I, uh, with the tubes on the post. I would say 65% of the birds bred in my aviaries are bred in those things rather than on the walls. The birds, they like the height and they seem to, they even have variations where things like red crests and um, singers and so, so forth nest here where your cordons and others will nest high and then right up in the top, I'm not in this particular area, but the song sparrows will go right up there and build their nests. So you have a multi-tier structure in, in a small area because they can attack it from all areas, all sides. Observation, as I said to you before, right, just keep going. it is critical to watch your birds. Um, I built this section on the end of, actually I took a part of the aviary out, but I built an observation room. I can sit there and watch my birds I simply have a circular disc over there. I just put some live food in, which tell, I can tell by how many times the bird comes back, whether it's feeding chicks, all the time I'm watching the birds. I also find it very comfortable to sit in there and away from my wife. But that's uh, <laughs> another story. She'd so probably glad you're in there. <coughs> Sorry? She'd probably glad you're in there. She probably is too. <laughs> my wife. But, the only thing I haven't put in is an air conditioner. I've got a PM, but I'll work on that. But basically, I can see up there. There is one very big drawback, I must admit, and that is when people come to get birds, I have great difficulty getting enough. Instead of being a five or ten minute transaction, it sometimes ended up an hour and a half. But it's it's enjoyable. But as I said, the main purpose of it is observation. The glass has a has a reflective shield on the outside, so the birds don't hit it. Occasionally, a, do a, a dove or something that's a bit silly decides to fly into the area, but uh, that's about all. So, but the, the amount of losses is very small. And that's the view outside. As you can see, incidentally, you can see the island post. See how they have been absolutely destroyed. The 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 use they've got so. I would replace that when I can, probably three times to four times a season. That's how, how heavily they, the birds use those things. You sit in there, as I said, you've got your circle, you've got your water. On the left hand side, you can just see that green roof. That is, a, that is one of the main feed, feed stations. But once again, I can sit there and look at them. This came up, I put this in, in my talk when I talked at Queensland recently at the last convention and a couple of others also came through with it. I never realised how popular running water is. 
In my aviary, I've got, oh sorry, doesn't matter, you're up. That's, that's an observation looking back, but can we go to the next one? Well, uh, running water. Uh, I've got a, a big bath set in concrete and with water plants in it and so forth, and I thought that the pond was probably the best thing I could, I could have until I did this, and all that is, is once again, a small mm -hmm. hip bath set in the ground, it comes a bowl with some gravel in it, it's the next level, and the stone I've got water pumps from the bottom up to the top and runs down. And they virtually ignore the bath now, and they are here, and it's amazing the amount of time birds spend and the time they come back. They'll, the slot where the water comes down, you'll find them coming up and drinking there, We'll have anything to, from six, eight, ten birds all bathing at the same, and they keep coming back. Mm -hmm. They will, in the summertime, the water will drop approximately six inches, or 150 mil, a day. And that's, obviously there's some evaporation, but it's basically the amount of time the bird times the bird's bath. They bath from, if I don't turn it on, they'll sit there and look at it. As soon as I, if I turn, because it's on a timer, as soon as the, the water comes on, they're all in. It's in cold. They are still bathing there. Now also, um, people think I'm a bit silly because I have slime in the pool. You can see it there. And particularly the other pond. You would be amazed at the amount of birds that eat that. If I pull that out and throw it on the ground, they'll come down and eat it. Now, I think it's got spirulina in it, and if it has, that would be the reason why so many of my birds are very red. My weavers are red, my painters are red, all the birds that have red feathers are intense red, and I'm sure that that's what they're getting. But, but it's it, it's like throwing eggshells to gullions, they'll come straight onto it. It's like the green stuff is the same, on the ground, and they'll come in and eat it. But they, they, they graze it all the time. They, they graft that plant, there's normally more cover over it, and they get through it, and they're in it all the time. Just another shot of it. It just cycles. The, one of the advantages is where the pebbles are, that water is only about 20 mil deep, maybe 25 mil. The, you'll find that the Australian species and African species will generally bath around the rim unless there's something there to, to but your, your um, Asiatic birds and your English birds will all get into the water and bathe. I think it's probably the predator type instincts from it, but, I, but I've noticed that a lot of the African species and other birds are now copying, watching them, um, uh, the Moonia's rock, because they get straight in, softbills get straight into the water, but the African species and the Australians will all try and drink around and bath around the edges. I think that's one of the reasons why they also come up to the top and drink up the top there. Okay. Just another shelter. Now, nor the old aviaries used to be two thirds open aviary, one third shelter, stuff the backs with um, tea tree, uh, seed water, heaps of termites, and away you went. Now, that system was very, very, very successful, particularly up at the Hunter area. Now, that's fine for there, but then you hit the areas like in Melbourne and Canberra's winters, which is where I am, you need that protection, but you also need the dry. So, there's no, much, no point in having me having a big flight with, with a small shelter, because when the inclement weather comes, all the birds have got to go somewhere. So, I, in my in my big aviary, I have, all my aviaries have got big shelters. But as you can see, they they are well protected. The bird, if it's bad, they can go in there. They also have f food and water, but that's not the main feed stations. That's basically a backup. I have a few hanging baskets where they they breed because there's certain birds seem to like to breed. <coughs> with solid roof over them. But you the thing that's 
the advantage is it's dry, it's it's ultra dry in there. So you don't get whether the winter rains in there. Um, it's like painters, painters will put up with cold, they'll put up with, with heat, I mean, but they won't put up with wet conditions. So you'll see them, they'll sit in a corner, if it's a dry corner, they'll spend all their time in there because that, that on the ground because they need that dryness. We used to lose painters through winter time. Um, now they either are in this over there, let alone, but in all my other aviaries, they're actually caught up and brought in and put in a bird room. The bird room's not heated or anything, it's in a separate bird room from my main one, but it's dry and we don't lose a painted through winter. Springtime, when it dries out, out they go and they start breeding. Okay. Just another shot, we've got, I've got windows there which I can open for the, in the summertime. An interesting thing in that, a few years ago when I didn't have the window, we had a massive storm and it physically blew the back end of my aviary out. You can see there's about the, the, the cross section of low down that hole area and I had birds flying everywhere. We got a lot but we just lost a lot. It's now been strengthened and so forth. But with a window, if I hadn't had that, even that gap, the pressure wouldn't have built up because it was wind going into a, an area. Okay. Okay, the same aviary, different shelter. I'm sorry about being not being really the cleanest, but I don't clean this time of year. It's breeding season, you leave it alone. Now, once again, all it is is this bit of seed there for them, but this is another shelter for the big aviary, just in case we have aggressive birds in the other aviary. It forces, instead of being forced out into the elements, they come into another section. So the point I'm saying is if you can, can have two areas, you're better off. Even if it's a divide in your shelter a little bit, just in case um, it gives you a bigger surface area and areas for birds that aren't aggressive to be to, to have an area to get away, more chance of getting away. Okay, we now out of my aviary. This is my a bird room which you everyone needs if you can, because for two things you can bring your youngsters in out away from the from your parent birds because they'll probably want to go to breed. Um, you can, and you can, birds that take longer to colour up, you've got, but you need areas for the hold them, and this is where, this is the one we use. This is early in the season, because there's not a lot of birds in there, but during the breeding season, we do start filling it up a bit. <coughs> inmates. Our birds are inmates, because they're locked up. So, off we go. I have to put him in first, because he's my favourite. Orange Bishop Weaver, um, you just roll on just slowly and we'll... Here's a couple of youngsters, they, they've probably been out of about nearly two weeks because they've got the tail and long feathers, but they're still begging for food, the lazy little hounds. Yeah. That gives you an idea of the size of the Orange Bishop Weaver, it's a red-faced petillia, so the hen birds are basically the same. Hen bird on her own. Cockbird, he's in his display mode. Right, now tricoloured nun do very, very, very well in grass aviaries. It suits them. The thing on this to look at is the bird's legs. 90% of all, that's probably being a bit hard. A massive amount of nuns that go onto the market have got scaly, rotten legs on them. And the reason is that they're, not, they're coming out of aviaries without grass. Put the moonies in the grass, they're up and down, it cleans them off and you end up with, with legs on them which, are, um, which is clean and not scaled. Another one of our weaver species, this is, this is a Napoleon weaver. Napoleon weavers are the success story of our birds, period. Um, in the 19, oh, here we go, in the, in the early 70s I struggled with these and keep them going and, and we got them going and doing like that. Today, there's probably 50 people breeding them in the, and to give you an idea, probably three years ago, maybe, they were about two and a half grand a pair. Today, 60. <coughs> now for something to go from there to there, they've done something, what it is, they're breeding for people, and they're becoming more and more domesticated, 
So therefore, they're, they're getting easier to breed. They are a terrific bird because they, they dispel any rumour of being aggressive to other birds. I find them uh, get along with all species. They, they display. I had a chap at my place one day and he, he was watching these display and he said, you don't have to sell those guys, they sell themselves. That's exactly right. Thank you. This is another shot. And keep. He's a pretty smart looking bird. Once again, see how clean his legs are? Because once again, up and down the, the grass. Cutthroats do well. In more in colder months, Gildian, that's, I don't normally keep many mutations. I've got, I've got red and white breasted, I've got black and white breasted Gildians, and I keep some yellow faced stars. The yellow faced stars I got off Ernie Reed way back in the 70s. So they're the only mutations, but uh, I must admit, I don't I quite like the white breasted. Okay, now we're going to the, into my, this is, this is for Sam here. <laughs> this is Pink Car Wider. Once again, we've had him going for about, I've had him since the early 80s. Um, now it's, we're bringing more Pink Car Widers in Australia than in captivity the world, the rest of the world, I would say. And that's a pretty big statement. But that's, that's we've got them domesticated. They're now, we know what they're going to do. They're, they're, what they do is, if you don't know, they are parasitic. They actually, the females lay their eggs in a St. Helena's nest and the St. Helena rears them along with her youngsters, unlike the cuckoo, where the cuckoo will throw the, the, the host um, young ones out. St. Helena, the pintail doesn't, it's reared alongside it. I, the, they must be colourblind for birds because geez, they're different. <coughs> Do you see the next one slide? No, oh, that's the cockroach. They grow that tail every year. There's four long feathers and they are approximately, I don't know, 300 mil long. For a little bird, it's the same size basically as the St. Helena waxbill. Next slide. There's a young pintail. Looks nothing like a young St. Helena, but the, uh, the parents uh, rear it. One thing I did find, I have found though, when they fledge early, and I mean a couple of days early, Often the parents will let them die. Yet I've seen them two days out of the nest feeding themselves. Next slide. It's not a very good slide, but I reckon it's pretty good. There's three young pintails out of the same nest. Now, <laughs> it's great that it was that to get three, but it also was a little bit of reflection. Maybe I, I didn't have enough host species and the forced hand birds to lay too many eggs in the one nest. But the same Melina, Read those three, and she didn't read any saints with her though. I think they were just two, just took over. Thank you. I'll There's swap, I'll swap if you've got too many, I'll swap you a few for some saints. Sorry? Right? I'll swap <laughs> you a couple of them for some saints if you're worried about not having enough saints. <laughs> 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 uh, there's, there's, a, there's this cock, male St. Helena, and that's, mm. that's the host species, that's the nominated one. And um, actually, the pintail widers have been responsible for making sure we'll always have them for a long while because most people that have got who breed the widest breed and keep a lot of St. Helena's like I like I don't need them that many for in in for next season but I probably put I'll probably put 80 on the market this year and they are a really nice little lady bird anyway even if you're not going to keep but the point I'm getting at is that the offspring is that there's plenty of those going on the market which is great they're just a nice little bird. It's golden song sparrow, or uh, Sudan sparrow. I wish never, no one ever called it the song sparrow, because people come up and say, do they sing? And they don't sing. In fact, they sound horrible. But they, they are very, very closely related to our, our sparrows in mannerisms. Um, I'm having problems with them at the moment. I was, uh, with, I'm finding that if I catch a lot of them up and let them go in, the, in, a, in a holding egg, they'll stress and they'll sit on the floor for three or four days. And after a while they come up again, um, i have talked to a vet at the moment, we're trying to work something out, we're going to try and spark them and things like that to see if we, 
but it's a stress, we think it's a stress problem, but it's, it gets embarrassing when a seller pair and they ring you up saying, you sold me a dead bird that's on the floor of the acre. Yet, within two or three days it'll be up fine. I don't know why. Okay. Another one that's South America, this is a bit of an enigma, this bird. I, I don't have, I'm not having that many problems with it, but it's, it's a different bird. It's, um, I don't know how long it's been here, but we'll call it here for, for a lot of years. But this is a South American uh, red crested finch. That's a cockbird. Sadly, he's, he's, he's washed out a bit, but um, that's the male. He has a crest, a vermilion crest. Unlike a cockatoo, which comes forward, he comes out in a fan across the top of his head. He is, what I could have said earlier, is an ambush displayer. A female will land on a bush and he'll suddenly burst out and carry on and flash his, his, his uh, crest and so forth. They're a relatively big bird, about the size of a goldfinch or canary, I guess. And that's the cockbird. The next one's the female. She's basically, she looks, looks very much like a, a big, a big ruddy. But uh, they are cup-shaped nesters. Um, normally, I only get, I only get two out of a nest. They occasionally three, but very big live food eaters, particularly when they've got chicks. They're just a constant backwards and forwards, male and female, to the live food tray while they've got chicks in the nest. I do keep a few um, soft bills. This is a female uh, white browed scrub wren. She gives a real evil eye, hasn't it? They, they breed. There's the, the crimson chat. There's another one. Red cap robin. That's a hindu sitting out. I put that in for a couple of reasons. One is to show up nesting in the in a rose bush, but also the rose bush hasn't got any leaves yet, so that's how early it's nesting. And they nest very early, and then the second nest by then the leaves have come and shoot. They'll still use the same nest. Um, I haven't got them at the moment, and as a, because I haven't got them at the moment, I've got heaps of cobwebs everywhere. When you have them, we used to let them into my bird room, the walkway, and they used to clean all the cobwebs out to build their nest. Lovely little bird though. That, that hen, it's a, much like my hen, but the ones I've seen in the wild have got slight red on their cap, the hens. Yeah. But I notice your one doesn't hardly got me. I can't see any red on them. They're very lot. They, they have got they? actually. The ones, only ones I've seen in the wild have got red. Because when I got mine and didn't have any red, I was red across concerned. there, and she has a bit of colour, but hmm. they. I think it's on that one. But they, I know what you're saying. Hmm. But um, the. Unless you're careful with them, the cockbirds will fade terribly. Hmm. But if you've got. If your red caps are staying red, your diet must be reasonably good. This day, uh, one of our <coughs> non-Australian softbills, little peeping robin, he's just coming, going to start to molt. He's not as great as that, but lovely birds. I mean, um, nature pair. The birds are quite good, but the background's pretty ordinary. But at least you can see what the, um, the size of. They're quite, they're quite a chunky bird, and uh, I think. I reckon they're, they're nearly hold. They can be held back. We they got to the stage of nearly losing them, but I think we we may keep them going. Next one. This one. Sadly, I think this one's just about. I put it in because they're such a lovely bird. But that's the, the close relative of the Peaky Robin. That's the uh, silvery Mesia. Um, that was a brilliant breeding pair, and I did a trade for the, the guy lost the bird on a female that night through negligence but anyway that's another story but they are, there's a few of them that i think they're too old they may come good i don't know okay magpie robin um i reckon we'll keep them going there's a few there was a big boom on them for a while and they uh, they settled down but they're, they're, there's a few there still um striking bird big bird nearly the size of a blackbird that's the cockbird there very, that's a shot that I was very proud of because getting four young birds from a soft out of soft bills 
tells me that my diet was right in as much as I had enough live food, it was balanced and whole, and the, the female could hatch four eggs and rear four. There was no third or fourth on the floor, she reared the whole lot, and that was, that was one of the boxes. You can't see the box there, but that one, I'll show you, you'll see some more on, later on with the cameras on it, but oh, the, that's a camera, those are the boxes. I used to paint the, 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 the back of the nest box white, because then I could check to see if I, uh, she was sitting, because I could see her tail straight up. But as you see, there's uh, that one is just showing, I, I, I put cameras on there, just to see, so I could watch them and observe them to uh, that I was doing the right thing. There was an aviary, it's that, uh, was that uh, oh, it doesn't matter, an aviary where I had a feed station down there on that plane and a nest box this way, and they were flying from there to there to feed the youngsters. And I noticed that two young ones were bigger than the other two, and I couldn't work it out. So I hooked the camera up and watched it. And what happened was that the bird would fly down, bank, and come into the nest. And as it came in at a slight angle, the two birds which were biggest were on that side and were snapping off the heads and bits of the mealworm as they went through. So they were getting a few more bugs, which made them, and that's why they, the sight they were slightly bigger. And that all came out from the cameras, right? Okay, that's. That, the, this is uh, the early days, but that's the cameras. And you, there's the nest box I was telling you about, you saw before, with the four youngsters. So we could, that was telling me here, there was the feed station, the nest boxes, and by doing that I could keep track of them. And because that was those, box, those they were well away from the, the, the aviaries, the birds didn't think no, I was around, could see them, and they act normally. There's no, very few birds act normally when humans are around. But by having the cameras in, we were able to get a reasonable idea of how they act. Now, that was my last pair of, I purchased my last pair of um, magpie robins there. They are in the paper bag. Unfortunately, I didn't bring them home. They was in Indonesia, I saw this pair, and I, had to, I felt sorry for them. So I negotiated, I bought them, the guy put them in the carry box there. I got my driver to take me up to a, a thing and I let them, let them go. They cost me uh, the equivalent of $4.50. <laughs> okay. Now, feeding and live food. Am I going all right or am I too long or too slow? Yeah, okay. okay. Earlier I said your, your feeding station. This, this is the main supplement feeding station. I've got, I've got, you know, other, the other, but this was where my soaked cedars feed out and I said I feed white millet and red millet also separately. That's the bottom row, well, there's a couple of them on. On the top you have fly larvae in the end of them, then you've got um, moths in the next one and this is my mealworm box. That is that's my box feeder. What it is, a simple square plastic box on, on some little legs, and it's got four one-eighth holes in them, drilled, so they're smooth. I throw the mealworms in, put the lid back on, and they drop in. Because with a big aviary, if you go and dump all your mealworms on, there's a mess crash of all the birds coming, and the birds that need them for long are lucky to get two or three cracks at it, but by doing it that way, they it just they keep dropping at a slow rate. Um, you find that if they're too slow, the birds that are, um, that are breeding will wait till they see one sticks its head out and they'll pull it out, get on with it. But it, I can put new worms in there and uh, a fair few and they'll be still there at lunchtime dropping out. If I want to slow them down, I just block a hole or two. If you want more, you just have more holes. But all it is is the hole you drill from inside so it's smooth. So because if you do it the other way, there's a jagged edge, they don't want to come out as much. But that's that drops over a period of time. Thank you. Okay, that's part of the diet. All it is is you've got yeah, I've got moss, cereal pound cake, maggots, 
Calibrated pellets, mealworms, and an orange. Um, that's on top of a seed, of course. And I also feed a huge amount of soaked seed. I'd rather, uh, it doesn't matter to me whether I, said I feed them a, a bucket full of soaked seed or a bucket full of dry seed. It's still seed, you know what I mean? And cost wise, I would rather them eat soaked seed, and my birds eat a lot of soaked seed, it's particularly when it's breeding to a period because it's easily digested and put in milk form to put into the youngsters. I don't, I don't need a chid, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm a bit lazy for that. What I do is I soak it for three hours, it's drained, I do it in big batches, it's drained very well, and then it's frozen. And then I use it, uh, I can feed it out at a time. Okay. Mealworms. We breed a few mealworms. This is our breeding stage, and that, what that is is the, we've got the breeders here, the beetles are in this side, you've got your boxes. Um, the reason they've got covers on because of, of a flower moth, we, we're getting on top of it now because we freeze our, we freeze our, um, our bran before we, we use it. That tends to kill most of the eggs of the moths that, that are already in the brand. But that's that's where they go. They're, they're, they're put out there and they sit in there and they're dated until they are around two thirds grown. And then, next slide. Then they're brought outside where it's not heated. And then it <coughs> slows them down and, it's, and it builds up because they, once it cools down under, under about 20, 26, they really slow down their, their, their growth rate. So obviously in the midtime it's not bad, in fact it's quite cold, so they, 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 they don't develop, they nearly go into a, uh, a limbo, but then when the breeding season is close, we bring them both all out and put them in the heat, away they go again, and then they grow that last bit. Otherwise we would never get through a season. Okay. Now this, something that we've fallen on to and I hope other people get to it. It's not uncommon, but that's the, your common moth trap. All it is is an electric fan, the circular, that's a UV light. At night you switch it on, the bugs see the UV light, go through, the fan sucks them into a bag behind. And if you get the next slide, there, there's your bag and next morning you collect it and uh, you feed it out. Now the difference is now is that we found if we collected them, we went in the aviary and let them go, the birds had a feast. But they look at the bird, they'd be going through the wire and everything like that. So, you know, 50% or more of our bugs were escaping. So we decided that we, I started freezing them, and because I was worried, I thought, oh, if I freeze the birds won't eat them. I reckon that they, just, they attack them just as much, if not more. So with the, 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 the advantage or disadvantage of a moth trap is that you have feast or famine. It's a hot warm night, you'll get, or you'll half fill that bag. If it's a cool night, you might get an egg, a cup full. So, which is no good if you're feeding birds, they need continuity. You must give them the you can't feed them some fly food A today and then say, oh, I haven't got any, I'll feed it later on. That doesn't work. You must give continuity. By freezing them, I've got continuity. Now I have, uh, I don't have to count them. I think, you know, the green seed containers, the plastic ones, I think I've got 11 full in my freezer. Now, because I don't want them now, but I want them at the season, when the breeding season early, and I still can't catch them, but I can still feed them out. If you keep going, oh. yes, that's that's another one. I, uh, but that just shows you a uh, the UV light filling in the bag, and they just come in. This next one, okay, they're frozen, and that's that's an ice cream container which I also use. But as you can see, in there's various moths, and well, we get lots of things in there actually. But you know the. The little white, but like these little tiny white ones, the uh, 
Cats love them. I recently acquired a pair of, of chaffinches and then I noticed them picking around these things within three days of them discovering them. They nearly knock us over every time. Now, that really is great. Not so much now, but in breeding season, I can all of a sudden put live food up front of them. It does a lot of things, particularly with soft bills, because there's so much roughage in them. It cleans them too, because like a pipe cleaner, but they'll, they'll take everything from a big moth to a small moth. The weavers will grab a big, or the, they'll grab a, a big moth and they'll go under a tree and work on it, knead it, knead it, knead it. But it, it's so, I just can't stress the, how great it's, it's helped us this year. Next slide. That's all that, that's, I did that as an experiment. I just went and found a backyard and a place and picked up bits and pieces. And that's a moth trap. All it is, is a piece of wood. Light fitting, some UV globes, a switch, a bag, a fan, a second hand fan, a collar. That's there to hold the thing on and it, oh, there's a stand as well. But, and that's all the, the moth trap is. And you would be amazed at the birds that, get, that will take it next. My glorious fly breeding box. Now, if you think about it, the quantity of flies those three boxes would produce is staggering. Right? Today, next slide. Sorry about the quality of it. That's all I use this now. So it's, it's actually cut my fly use by two thirds. I still breed, fly, I still breed a big lot of flies because that's my backup. It's amazing what birds will still go and go, go into the fly larva. But um, obviously that's until the end of the season because it's uh, like that because you don't, you can't just put pull all the flies out and tell them to sit there while you clean it out. They sort of don't hang around. But as you see, I'm down to one, so I've cut my fly usage down by two thirds. I can't really finish. Don't leave it at that now. I've just about finished. I put this one in here. This is an old slide. And I'll put it there to see if I can, if you guys can look at it eventually work out and you tell me how many different species are there. <laughs> I'll leave it up there. But basically, that's what you call a mixed collection. It's a long while since I've had a lot of those birds. I can tell because of the Australian birds in it. But um, we, you can keep that amount of birds if you've got a big aviary. But as I said earlier, less is more. The less you've got in the aviary, the more you'll breed. Because you don't have the competition, you don't have the stress on it, and the birds are not, uh, can pick their spots far easier. There's no, they have less fights. Now, some of the best breeders that I know run small aviaries with two or three pair of birds in them, and their results are far are far superior than mine in my big aviary, but my my aviary is my hobby, and I say now if I pull all my bees out and cage bred them or small aviary, I would probably breed a lot more. But that's not what it's there for. But as I said, so whether you've got small aviaries or big aviaries, as long as you manage them, you will get good results out of them, and you'll get plenty of enjoyment. Thank you. Grass you were growing in your aviaries. Was that was that a power or something? Was it? Or? <laughs> no, I don't know what it is. Don't know I, what it is. I name all the grasses by places I get them from. That's Jack Hard's grass because I got it from Jack's place in Castlemaine. <laughs> but if you want some, I can pull it out and send it up there. It, it, it's a terrific grass. It's a grass that it doesn't send runners out. Particularly if you if you put a circle in, and all I do is. Put a plastic circle in the ground, plant it in there, and then each year I cut it right back because I want the nice clean growth because it, it really gets ragged and, and battered by the end of the season. And um, it, needs, it needs cutting back to get that nice green. In fact, 
I'm nearly at the stage where I'm pulling them out, putting new ones in, and rotating on new plants. But, it, but they, they, they eat the seed and get, I can't, you can hardly see the seed. But it's, uh, Uh, if you weed it, you um, I know you have a few varieties there, which varieties would you keep in the next collection and which ones would you use? Well, in the big aviary, I keep orange bishops, napoleons and pintail otters. Yeah. Um, pintail otters are the ones that put the pressure on um, because they, the male is very territorial on his feet, uh, on the feeding area because he would dive bomb and push, trying to keep the feeding areas for his females, they do it in the wild, they do it in the aviary. Um, going back to what I was saying, I think grenadiers are a little bit more tough on the, on the, on the local habitants than, than orange bishops or Napoleons. Madagascar weavers I keep on their own, but I have had a mixed case, but I just, I don't know it's not over, I've been even left. The, my choice, if someone would come to me and said, what weaver do I get? Without batting an eyelid, I'd say Napoleons. Without batting an eyelid. Because I know that they're, they're really showy, they will breed, and they don't have to anything. But I, I'm only speaking on my experience, and I should point out that what I'm saying to you, you analyse, you listen to other people, and you work out the best bets of every other one. Because there's no one here that is a, an expert on birds. We're all learning all the time. But, uh, just you know, analyse and work out and listen. And listen. You listen to someone else and then you compare. I'm sorry, I'm saying like a preacher here. Do you get any, like you said, you don't fully save your seeds, or is there any more nutrition by only just saving it by three hours? No, you, if, you want nutrition, if, you don't, if you want nutrition, you, 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 chip, you let the cheese yeah, seeds yeah. seed chip. Now, the only reason I'm feeding seed, soak seed, is just because it's easier to digest yeah. for the breeding birds. Yeah. You know, and uh, also it's, um, with, there used to be a theory on, on white millet to buildings. In the old days they used to say, you shouldn't feed white millet to buildings. And one of the reasons they ca that came up is that if they lost young buildings through, through the cold, and obviously you know, the hen bird gets off them, when they die, they'd still have a few seeds left and they could see it through the crop and it was white millet. Because white millet takes the longest to, to soak and go down and digest. So then people thought, oh well, it's the <coughs> white millet that's killed them, not the, and, you know, which is, I guess, a, a reasonable surmise. But by soaking it, you don't have that problem. You know, and you need, you need soak seed at dawn. A bit off eating soak seed for the night, the night so they come off, because that's when your chicks are starving. Yeah. They need food. And because it's the cake and the, and, and the soak seed, the parents, the birds can eat it, put it in a milk form quickly. Yeah, if, if it's dry seed, they'll come and eat and drink, drink and then they'll fly around the aviary bit well, it's two and then they'll feed well they don't have to fly around, they fly through the nest and that's the only reason and, and what seeds do you soak? so I just soak a normal mix just a normal mix? just a normal mix I'm lazy I'm sorry but I am that's, you know, they that, I can't, they, they eat, that's it, they eat a dry or, or, or they eat a soak but it's real, and it's not hard to soak seed. And if you drain it, it's not, all you do is freeze it. We do, I do a big bucket full, or two bucket fulls. They drain, <coughs> they, they, they drain, I generally drain them for about four hours or overnight. So it's, because the better, the more, the more it's drained, the less it freezes in a lump in the, in the freezing. It's got less water. And it's just, and I, I just come up and spray out, frozen and they take in. I throw a little bit along the, the feed table because the youngsters come in and they, they can because they can crack a bit quicker. But, uh, that's that's what I do. You know, I noticed um, 
choose to show the photos of screens, you choose to do a screen until they just pick up what's in the air. So I get soaked sleep off those screens. I've got too many to be fiddled with, to be honest. It's, uh, and uh, um, I'm not saying it's, what I really should be doing is, is, is cutting the, the wild oats and freezing them and, and possibly white millet and freezing it between layers of paper and then feeding it out. But I really don't know if I, my results would be any much better. Because you always gauge, I always gauge my management by the chicks. You know, if, I, if I'm getting one chick a nest, the alarm bells ring up. Because what they're doing is letting them drop off because there's something missing. If I'm getting clutches of, of three and four, I get a buzz out of that because I know I'm doing, doing something reasonably well. And, I, and whether it be four cordons or something, it doesn't matter. It could be four of anything. It could be, as long as if you're getting, if you're getting four clutches, your management's pretty good. Uh, you may not, you know, you might not, you might feed all green feed and no steaks there. Fine. If you're getting four clutches, you're doing the right thing. Good. Yeah, COVID nineteen. You yeah. try colours and all that. Eat the mops as well. Nah, cordons do. Tries don't. The tries, the only live food the tries will eat long, they'll come in and grab a meal. And, but they're, they're not big live food eaters, they're big soak seed eaters. They're not big, they go on to the soak seed. Yeah, because I thought about doing it with the moss and all that, you know, setting it up, setting it up. I'm only all these features sort of thing, so. Yeah, but they're, they're all my features are, all, sorry, not all my features, but the features are idiots. If areas where I haven't got soft bills, yeah. I still feed it and they take it. Still go. Uh, what do you run your weavers in, uh, like trios, pairs? Um, yeah, trios, threes, a tree, bishops I run three or four, only because I've got two very good cockpits. Um, Napoleons, I have more success with trios than I do with anything else. And I was asked recently what was my most valuable bird, and the, my most most valuable bird in my collection is a particular orange bishop weaver cockbird. He might be the most valuable in dollars, but to my collection he is. And you know, it's but but he, I reckon I could put six hen birds in his aid in with him, and he he would put them down. But it creates a problem. I'm better off having him with four hen birds. And another one with three or four hen birds because I, I can't sell brother and sister then. So, what I've got to do is I, have two, I run two colonies of orange bishops, two colonies of Napoleons, and so forth, because then I can pull the young ones from there and I'm not selling brother and sister yeah. like a lot of people do. Yeah. They're, they're inbred enough, you know, mm -hmm. they, you don't want to court too much disaster. And is that the same with the wider? Like, what are you? Yeah, two. Two pairs. Uh, I, if I didn't have a big aviary, I've got enough. I'd run them up here. Because it's not so much, um, I don't worry about having to worry about the build a nest. What I've got to worry about is have I got enough hosts? Now, if you've got, you've got two hen widers wanting to breed, you, you can find, or three or four, you know, they'll all hone in on the one nest and in the end the, the host bird will say oh there's too much aggravation here, I'm out here and leave them. So you're better off having one one or two hen birds in, and they, they'll set up areas, if you've got an area, areas in your aviary, the saints that are breeding in there and there and around the grass, the hen birds will work out their areas and they'll defend those areas to try and stop this over of the, the nest or interference. Mm -hmm. Well, I've watched them, I've watched the hen bird pintail go in and lay into a, in a saint's nest right near my window. I could see it, we watched it, we eventually watched the young one fledge. But she defended that area vigorously, wouldn't let any of the other. I was running, I actually ran three hen birds in the big aviary. But I've got a lot of area, I've got a lot of birds in there. Yeah. But in the other aviaries, I run pairs. Yeah. My ratio is probably better than the pairs. 
And how many saints do you run with it generally? Like obviously you know a lot in the big well, every yeah, And then you've got the, 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 the stuff. But I, I would say you need, personally, you need a minimum 10 pairs of per game. The more the better, obviously. Yeah, yeah. And because they rotate and what, what one of the I things I did this year was because they mature very quickly, I pulled 20 pair of saints, young ones, and put them aside and rung them. And then two thirds of the way through the season, I let them go. Because they were now old enough to breed. And they in turn were the ones that were fledging the, the, um, the young pintails at the end. Because the others had, had finished by then. Fan that you're using is it just an ordinary cell? Ordinary kitchen fan. Yeah, yeah. Just a old fan. That was a second-hand one. That really, that's that's all they are. And uh, but there's a lot of people using moth traps. But the thing is that we've been freezing them, and you know we can use you can use live food for a lot of things. Um, just one question about your frozen moths, sir. <laughs> How long do they last once they're thawed out? You know, like other, like dead maggots. You know, for instance, go pretty putrid, pretty dead quick. Not very How long. How long do they last? Not very long. Is it eaten? Sorry. They're eaten. They're gone. Oh, so you're feeding enough that they're sort of eaten within well, the next hour or two. I, 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 if I overfeed them, hmm. they're, they're there tomorrow. I must admit, though, they'd rather than have the the fresh ones. Hmm. The, the frozen ones, but the, you, I'm serious that the amount that they're eating that quickly, it's, it, it's, it's I'm surprising. Try it. I'm going to try it. Yeah. Well, it makes sense because it's, mm. you, know, you, you know, if you've got, enough, you've got moth traps, obviously, mm. you know what it's like, you have feast or famine. Mm. And you've got, to, you've got to fill those so you get the air pool. And as long as your containers are airtight, you won't have a problem. If they're not airtight, eventually you'll end up with dry moths and they'll be useless. But you, you, you need to, as long as they're, they're tight, you, that, that, you've got no problem. It's a lot easier feeding them than, than maggots. <laughs> hmm. Not that smelly, is hmm? Not that smelly, is <laughs> They shouldn't be smelly if they're done properly. Yeah. Maggots. Well, I guess there's a question. <laughs> how, how do you stop them from sort of getting to that? I, when I do mine, I find that, the, well, recently, um, that the stuff they're in sort of turns black and whatever. Do you. When you're freezing them? You no, no, I don't no. freeze them. No, well, see. Just. just well, can I talk on maggots? Well, yeah. Okay. <laughs> the problem with maggots is that. A lot of people don't have enough flies in their, in their box. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't care how we do it because other people do it different ways. And if you lived in Queensland, it's a different system because you've got high humidity and other things. But your clients are very similar. I get, I mix bran, water, and milk powder or whey powder together. I don't put a lot of. Uh, milk powder or whey powder in. Um, I get, well, let's go on large la, okay, what am I talking, large margarine container, right? For every five large mar, margarine containers of bran, I would have one third ice cream, uh, one third of a bran a container of, of, of um, milk powder. The water goes in, and it's mixed, and you can pick it up, and there's no no water comes out. The only way you get the water out is if you put it in your hand and squeeze it, and the, the milky water will come through. So you're looking at that. It's not dry, it's wet, but it's not slushy. Okay, that goes in to your your fly box. Uh, yeah, and the problem is that if you've got a lot of flies, they will they will lay their eggs, the, fly, the larva will hatch and eat the stuff and you're pulling it out before it goes wrong. Now, what you do is, if you're going to hold them, you bring them out and as you say, they should be, if you've got a lot of, your, your brands disappeared and it's like, like brown powder, right? 
tea bag, tea leaves, something like that. Right up. So what you do is when you're mixing up your mix for the others again, what I do is put a bit on the top, not on the bottom, on the top, and it brings them up and it keeps them big. I feed them out. I don't clean them. I don't do anything. Well, that's how I do it. But if you haven't got a lot of flies, that's when they're not eating all the milk and stuff, and that is why you're going to, they're going off. That's the amount. That's a, I remember I went into a chap up in the Hunter, and he had so many flies in his box, they had to sit on each other. I couldn't believe it. But you put it in, pull it out, and they, they were eating all of it. And that's the, you probably, if you haven't got a lot of flies, you're better off going into very small containers, right? Rather than the big container, because there's less fruit, there's less maggots to eat that product, so therefore you, they, they won't go off. Yeah, well, I'm only running 500 gram, you know, the standard sort of margarine containers, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, well, we did have a problem because we went away and somebody else was looking after them, and we got down to about 30 flies, and then <laughs> had to breed them back up again, but. Uh, but I'm still finding that. I walked into a guy's place one day and said, "What's their names?" Yeah, because <laughs> his flybacks that, that was how few there. And you, you know, you can, I think you can go too many. Mm. But my my fly colony, we're talking about inbreeding. My fly fly colony is 17 year old. So imagine how many brothers and sisters have been breeding over 17. And they still fly. I don't you're think not fly getting well, not fly. getting pods or yellows or anything out. Of them. <laughs> I'm not looking that close. <laughs> All right. You also got labour in the fly. <laughs> worming, Dave. Do you work no. with in the April flies? No. What I don't you? want. To, I don't want to go into that. You don't get bay hops or anything like that. I, uh, that that's by choice. Yeah. One thing I do do do, I don't overcrowd. Yeah. Now I'm not saying to people. Um, not to work because there's too many people say learned people saying you should but what worries me is that there's a lot of people that work who don't know what they're doing if you're going to work have a real good read and talk to people how to do it properly and I've got no problems with that I'm just old fashioned can I ask that photo? How many good are there? Yeah, how many? I, I was in camera. 14. Who said 14? You're wrong. You're wrong. I said 20. No, nearly, but under. 17. You want me to tell you what? It's 19 that I can see, and I've got crook eyes. I can. Okay. I know one that's people have missed. I'm going to read them there. What have we got? Double bars, black throat, painted, plum head, star, blue face, red heads, strawberry, try none, fire, St. Helena, Jacarini, cordon, there's grenadier weavers, song sparrows, canaries, goldfinches, and greenfinches. And the 19th is a sparrow. <laughs> He's gone. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.